So welcome to this tutorial which builds on the tutorial on peeling uh, that I released a few weeks ago. And in that tutorial I promised that I would say something more about how to make the pieces that peel off seem more random and natural by using shading. Uh, and in fact there are a couple of ways uh, that you can do this, but the method I'm going to demonstrate here relies on baking out some UV maps. So let's demonstrate how to do that. Now, in fact, I've adapted uh, the scene file already so that there are some uh, some UV coordinates laid out on this mesh, and you can see them here. And those would be useful for um, putting your main texture onto your onto your object, uh, because that's just an unwrapped box. But what we want to do is have each individual peeled piece having its own island of UV coordinates. So we're going to need to do something a bit more sophisticated than a, a straight UV flatten to do that. But the first thing I'm going to do is lay down a layer sob. And what's, what this does is it's going to, if I set this to two, it's going to make sure that an additional set of UV coordinates are created. So at the moment, we've got a set of UV coordinates uh, which you can't uh, see. So let me try here, maybe that will work. So we've got uh, a set of UV coordinates here just called UV. Uh, that We can see them in here, I expect. So we've got a set of UV coordinates called UV, but we want another set called, which we're going to call UV2, in order to be able to apply different maps using different uh, UV coordinate sets. So the layer sob allows us to create a, a second set. So once we set this up, any UV operator that we do now will create UV2 attributes rather than UV attributes. And actually what I want to lay down is a for each loop. And you'll remember from the earlier tutorial that we've already got an attribute set up called name, which is different for each of the different peeled pieces. So this is going to loop through all of the peeled pieces and it's going to produce, uh, if we lay down a UV flatten, it's going to produce some UV coordinates for each of those. Uh, so let's have a look at that. It's going to take a second to work. And then if I go into UV view, you've got this extraordinary image here. And that's because we've got all of those different UV coordinates overlapping, which is why we're getting that odd pattern there. So let me just move all of this out of the way. And now what we need to do after we've individually mapped the UVs of each of those different patches, uh, we want to put on a UV layout. And what that should do, there we go, is it should lay out all of our pieces. Now you'll see at the moment they vary hugely in the area of UV space they're taking up. So some of them are taking up, this is a very small piece, in fact, it's taking up a big area. This is a big piece, it's taking up a small area. So on this, uh, let me swap this back. On this, we need to take correct island area proportions. And now we can see that that uh, looks correct in terms of the areas. And the basic technique uh, we're going to use here is to use the compositing program to create a transparency map. And rather than just using the transparency map that we can generate by baking, uh, which would just have opaque here and transparent here, we're going to vary it a bit so that when this comes to rendering, this edge won't appear straight, but will appear curved because we will have added some variety into the way we calculate the transparency. So the first thing we need to do is to bake all of this out. And we can do that here by going into the out. Let me just return this back to the perspective view. To the out, uh, the output part of our network. And I'm going to lay down a bake texture. Now, I should say, by the way, that uh, I've moved on to using Houdini 15.5 here. So a few things uh, are slightly different. If you're, if you're following this through with Houdini 15, you'll find that a few things are a bit different. But I'll try to point them out when 
I can. So the first thing that we need to do is let's maximize this. So we're going to create uh, some renders. So let me, in fact, render this into the image directory. And I've got some already rendered out, but that doesn't matter. And we'll call it UV Islands dot jpg whoops jpg right we don't need any sophisticated information here all we need is the material uh, which will give us white where the objects are and black where they are not we must make sure that we are going to use the right set of coordinates for the uv unwrapping which is uv2 not uv1 and everything else I think can stay at the defaults. We need to set up our UV object to be our base deforming object. And we need to give it a different shader from the one that we would use during normal rendering because we need a constant white shader on here. So first of all, let me find the constant shader, which is down here somewhere. There we go. So that's a constant white shader. Now, rather than just apply this, what I want to do is create a take. So I'm going to add a take, press enter to rename it, and we'll call it constant shade. And with that take selected, which is, you can select it up here, we want to go into our object network and we want to have a look at this base deforming object and we want to look at its material and we can see this is grayed out at the moment. That means it's not included in this take. But I can do this, and it will be included. And then I can change it from the shader that we're going to use when we're rendering the beauty pass to this one, uh, which is constant. So flip this back to main. And then on our output, make sure that we are rendering with the take constant shade, like so. And perhaps I will up this resolution to 2048 by 2048. And if we render this, I can render it to mplay for the moment, just so that we can see it. And let's hope that works. There we go. So we can see uh, that what we're getting is white where the patches are and black where they are not. So you can see this has come up with an error, and I had forgotten. In fact, you can't probably see the error here. Uh, but it's warning me that because I've chosen JPEG, it's not going to work properly. So it's it's redone it to a RAT file, which is Houdini's own format. But that doesn't matter, uh, because we can go into the composite view. And I'm going to lay down a image network. And let's call it composite. Uh, let's call it... Uh, noise pieces, for example, doesn't matter what we call it. And what I'm going to do, swap this back, is lay down a file SOP, which is going to bring in this image, uh, which is going to be called UV Islands dot rat, I think. And there it is. Okay, so uh, now we're going to do a little bit of work to make this more more like a random uh, texture. And you can do this in various ways. You could uh, take a paint program and, and paint over this and uh, do it by hand. I'm just going to do a quick and dirty uh, bit of manipulation using the compositor here. So I've in fact already set up the network here to save a little bit of time. So this is the original image that uh, came from our render. And then I'm inverting it, uh, like so. And then I'm using an expand node. And what the expand node is, it, it adds white pixels around the existing white pixels to a size that you specify here. So it's adding five pixels. So it's shrinking these areas of black. And then I'm inverting it again. And in fact, what it's doing, therefore, is shrinking the areas of white. So if we compare this and this, you can hopefully see that these are smaller. So this has already introduced a little bit more variety in our map.
the next thing I do is use a deform uh, cop. And what the deform cop does is it takes two inputs. And this is a rather slow one to work out, so it's important to set the scale really low before you start. So the second input is a something which tells the node how to deform the image that's coming in to the first input. And I'm just using some noise here. Let me show you the noise. Uh, so I've made sure that it's set up to be the same size as our input. And I'm just using single noise. I'm not creating a separate noise for each component. And I've incremented the, I've increased the, the frequency. And the other thing I've done here is just subtracted a little bit from the result so that uh, these values actually go uh, from negative to positive. So the value here is negative, the value here is, is positive. And that means that it will shift when we come to these this deform node. Uh, what it's doing is it's saying it's taking this as a UV square and it's looking at the current UV coordinate and it's moving whatever is there uh, by the amount uh, in UV terms that is coming in on the noise scaled by this scale here. In fact, the, we should put that on repeat. And the result, as you can see, is rather a nice uh, sort of variation in our texture now. And the final thing I'm doing just for completeness is doing a minimum with the original UV island so that we don't get these areas of white spreading out beyond the original areas of white. So it's just going to contract things. And we can see that looks pretty good. Now, this is all looking much more varied. Well, the next thing we do need to do is to work out how to use this in a shader. And we're going to need to build a bit of a bespoke shader. I've already got here, and I was using in the, in the renders that you saw in the earlier tutorial, a standard mantra shader to, to produce the colored clay sort of surface gray surface that we saw. So we're going to adapt this. And if I dive down inside, you see all we get is a, is a warning. There's nothing else there. And the warning tells us that, that, that we need to unlock the network before we can edit it. So I need to right click on this and there's an option. Again, let me just swap these. There's an option here to allow editing of contents. And that is what I need to do. And now when I dive inside, I get this enormous network. And there it is. We can see all of it. The bit we're interested in is the opacity section, which is down here. And we're eventually going to use that texture as an opacity map. But we need to do something here in the opacity color node to make sure that it works properly. Now, at the moment, uh, this is going to take the S and the standard S and T coordinates for the object and use those as the basis for our map. Whereas, of course, we need the UV2 coordinates. So we can do that using a shading layer parameter. So this allows us to grab a parameter UV coordinates from layer two, which is the thing that we generated earlier. And this comes out as a vector. We need a we need an S and T coordinate, so I need to just do a convert vector to float. And then the first one of these goes in here and the second one goes in here. And now this is going to allow us to use a opacity map correctly in this shader. So let's do that. So let me reduce this and then back in the parameters here, let's uh, increase these. So we've got opacity and I can say use map. And the map uh, that I'm going to use is the, uh, in fact, there's a very important step, of course, that I, that I missed earlier on, uh, which is that uh, we didn't write out the result of this. So I need to do a ROP file output. And I'm just going to render a single frame. And I'm going to render it to uh, a file called opacity.jpg. I mean, obviously, if this was a production 
uh, level example I wouldn't be using a JPEG but uh, I'm just using that for speed and so that I can probably parcel it up with the project file later on. So if we render this uh, what we should get is it compositing out the network. So uh, let's go back to our material palette and uh, pick this up for our give ourselves a little bit more space here. Pick this up for our opacity map. So remember opacity is one, it means you can't see through it, and opacity is zero, you can see through it, so the black areas are going to appear transparent, they're going to be rendered transparent. So let's just uh, have a look at our render view, and let's just render out a frame. And that seems to be, I seem not to have set up a camera here. Let me just uh, set up a camera properly. Uh, that's, a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good view for a camera, so let's do that. And then let's render using that camera. Right, and we can see immediately we've got a problem, uh, which is that even at the beginning, our texture is completely uh, sort of split up like this, and we, we don't want that. Uh, there's a, the, these big areas here, in fact, because I've got the um, I've got the uh, display node on the wrong node. So let me put it on here. So now that should. reduce those. Uh, let me see what's going wrong there. Oh, I've, I've got it on the underlying object there. That is not what I want. What I want is to put it on the cache here. Right, that's got rid of the big ones, but we can still see we've got these small ones. So how are we going to address that? Well, if you remember, uh, we were using a, an attribute in the earlier tutorial to determine whether or not a piece was going to split off from the from the block and fly away, and that attribute was called pin to animation. And when pin to animation is one, uh, then this is sticking to uh, the block, and when it's zero, then it it flies off. And that's exactly the attribute we need to ensure that this these sort of gaps are not rendered when the material is still sticking to the block. So we can adjust our shader to take account of that. So let's go back into the material palette and have a look again at this, this shader. So one of the very, very powerful things about shading in Mantra is that you can use any attribute uh, that is on your geometry to drive the shading. So we can actually access that pin to animation attribute in the shader here and use it. So I'm going to lay down a parameter node. That's uh, what enables us to grab that attribute. And I'm going to call it, uh, say, palm pin to animation. And the key thing is that this name here has to be the same as the attribute, like so. It's a float, so that's fine. Uh, and I want to make sure it's invisible. If I don't click invisible, then this will turn up in the parameters of our shader at the upper level, and we, we don't want that. So this is going to be one uh, when uh, we want the map not to apply, and zero when we want it to apply. Now, fortunately, there's already here a control, where is it? Texture intensity, there we go. So if I double click that little module, then this comes up. So this is this control determines how much effect our texture is going to have. So when this control is zero, this uh, texture is going to have no effect. Uh, so obviously what we need to do is to complement this. And that means essentially invert it. Uh, we, we subtract it from one. So now this is when the material is stuck to the thing, this is going to have a value of zero. And when it's flying off, it's going to have a value of one thanks to this complement node. And then if I multiply this, 
what we should find is that this now controls the intensity of the texture so that when the material is stuck to the block uh, the texture will have no effect. It only starts having an effect once the material starts flying off. So let's close this down and then let's have a look at the render. Well it's already re-rendered and we can see that it is rendering as we would expect with the whole thing being grey. So of course this cache uh, that we rendered out from the previous tutorial isn't going to work now because we've added additional attributes here, UV attributes, uh, which we need to carry through to the to the end of the simulation. So I'm going to need to uh, recache the simulation. So I'm going to do that, I'm not going to record that, and I'm going to return after that has cached out. So that's now all cached out, so I can just scrub along the line here and it will re-render and I hope we can see that it's now got a more realistic sort of tearing type edge to it than the triangles that we had earlier. You will see there's a bit of blurring occasionally and that's because of the way this pin to animation control works. It's it's going to blur things a bit occasionally but uh, in practice because of all the motion going on here you probably won't notice that in reality, particularly if you're motion blurring your render, which I, I don't think I'm doing in this case yet. But as you can see, uh, that's one way to address the issue of having this rather regular edges to your pieces. Just to remind you how it was done, so we took our shader, uh, we looked at the opacity controls here, um, we decided to use the opacity map, but we're basing it off the second set of UV coordinates. So, uh, uh, where are we? In our object, uh, there are two sets of coordinates. You can see UV2 here. We're using that to drive the map. And the other thing we're doing in the material is that we're multiplying this tint intensity, as it's called. In other words, the strength of the effect of the map we're multiplying that by the complement of the pin to animation to ensure that it doesn't, the cracks don't appear until things are beginning to tear off. Anyway, I hope that's been uh, a useful look at one way to address the issue of rendering out these, these tearing pieces.